Engine 5.7 released a few days ago. In the meantime, I've been trying to get together a comprehensive review, at least of uh, everything that has been released, but I also wanted to cover the performance changes um, that have happened in the upgrade. Now, while performance wasn't the only thing as part of this release, um, as always, we want to compare the different versions and see whether we've had some improvements or some decreases. Now, my game that I'm testing in may not be indicative of every single game out there. As you can see behind me, I've got some of the tests showing off. But I do have Nanite on, I have Lumen on, I've got um, some stuff going on in the UI. So there's a lot of different things going on, including the new text rendering system. Uh, I have that set to rasterize the text so that I can make my text glow. Um, but this is hopefully going to be a close of an idea of what kind of performance changes we can expect. Now, if you go ahead and look, I've got a um, graph up as well as the actual raw numbers. Um, so the top three numbers are three of the tests that I ran in uh, inside of the editor. Uh, and then three tests I ran in standalone and then three tests I ran in packaged. Now there is uh, three tests that I ran for the FPS, three tests that I ran for frame time. And these are all different because I want to run as many possible tests as possible. That's why you'll see sometimes the frame time and the FPS may not be exactly what you'd expect from a frame time to match the FPS, uh, but they're just a collection of different runs. Um, and then you can see here over in 5.7, I've also got the same idea. I ran some PIE, ran some standalone, and ran some packaged. Now, like always with Unreal Engine, you can kind of see that there's generally a trend towards, uh, as you head towards packaged, you get more FPS. As you head towards PIE, you get less. Uh, and the same with frame time where we get, you get higher frame time uh, in PIE and lower frame time in package, which of course lower frame time is always better because that means you're going to be getting higher FPS. They correlate. Uh, and then 5.7, we see the very similar trend, higher FPS, lower frame time. Um, now, one thing that is interesting is when you compare the two, the average FPS uh, between all three, standalone PIE and packaged for 5.6.1 was 96.7 frames per second uh, with a frame time of 10.4. And then in 5.7, the average FPS was 104.6 with an average frame time of 9.5. So you can see there about a, it just averaged, of course, about a millisecond improvement on the frame time um, and about an increase of about 10 frames per second. And if we look at the graph, it tells a very similar story where uh, down in PIE land here on the far left, uh, we can see that they're actually somewhat close with 5.7 pulling ahead slightly in some cases. Um, and then in the standalone, we actually see for the first one, it actually flips. Uh, 5.6.1 was slightly faster in this test than 5.7, uh, but then they were about the same on the second test and uh, 5.7 pulled ahead in this third test. So there is some margin of error as while these tests are basically identical, there are some fluctuations that happen depending on you know, what shaders are building um, and all that when you're in standalone and PIE mode uh, because they do um, skip a lot of the optimization steps, right? When we jump over to the built version, you can see there's not as much fluctuation now. Um, and even then, even when they fluctuate, they're not coming anywhere near each other. So an example, you know, looking here, we're looking at about a 20 frame per second increase. This one is about a, a 12 to 13. And then over here on the far end, we have another about 14, um, which on average makes sense because we're looking at about an average of about uh, 10 frames per second faster. Um, but yeah, so that's at least what we're seeing here. And the graph, the milliseconds, it's a little harder to see just because frame times are so closer. That probably could be a separate graph. Um, but I just wanted to plot these in a sort of a simpler way to see. Um, but yeah, so that's it for this. Let's go ahead and jump into the uh, actual changes the engine has made. Uh, so there's been a number of changes in 5.7. A lot of it has been around uh, PCG, specifically um, some changes to the uh, general flow and, and efficiency. I believe they've, they've um, fixed a couple issues as well as they've improved um, a couple of the slower parts of PCG. Uh, they also added a new PCG editor mode, uh, which allows you to draw splines, paint points, or create volumes. Um, as you can see, I'll have this link down below if you're more interested in the actual release document itself. Um, but 
you know, example here, they talk about the PC G GPU compute is now significantly faster. Um, they've also given a procedural vegetation editor, which allows you to make um, a little bit more uh, scalable uh, and speedy um, changes to vegetation. Uh, and then as well, they have some quick sold mega plant asset, assets um, as part of the experimental release. Now, this is something that I think a lot more people are going to be interested in, uh, and that's going to be nanite foliage. Um, now, I believe it's still in the experimental um, stage, but um, basically one of the biggest problems nanite has had um, has been with foliage because you couldn't make it nanite. And so there's uh, because of the transparency, there's been a lot of issues. Uh, but now, apparently, with nanite foliage, um, there's going to be a lot more uh, tools to incorporate that into your nanite workflow. Uh, another thing that has now been marked as production ready is Substrate. Um, I have used it here or there. It's a definitely strong tool, uh, but Substrate has some really good improvements in this release um, that are going to make it so that anyone using it is going to have a lot uh, more smooth uh transition then we have mega lights uh, going from experimental to beta um, that's pretty cool because i know that this is going to be a big thing for a lot of people because it's going to massively uh, improve the number of dynamic shadow casting lights you can have so basically if you don't know mega lights um, as you can see here in this little demo ups how many dynamic lights you can have in a single area before you were kind of uh, limited somewhat uh, not just in terms of pure number like the editor itself, but actually the performance, you would start seeing lots of drops with that many shadows and things like that. Um, but with Mega Lights, they've done a pretty big overhaul of how the system works. So it's a lot more stable and a lot smoother. Uh, they've added some extra things to MetaHumans. Um, not really something I'm that interested in myself, but uh, if you are interested in it, there's some more details here about um, all the different changes they've made. Um, they've added some extra tools to the in editor animation tool set. Um, so if you do animations inside the editor, they've basically given you some more tools here, um, as well as some selection sets that can let you do some pretty crazy stuff. Uh, they also added a IK, IK retargeter that has a, oh, I'm trying to remember what they called it. Uh, oh, here we go. So it has a new tool that allows it to be basically more spatially aware of itself. Um, so when you retarget the default animations in this example here uh, to this larger body, as you can see, there's a lot less overlap. Now there's still a little bit, uh, but there's a lot less overlap than the normal animation would give because basically what it does is it pushes out the animation a little bit. Basically it provides you a way to offset the animation uh, more dynamically by it sort of detecting where the mesh looks to be ending. Um, so rather than, you know, a hand going all the way through a mesh and um, going to the actual position of the animation, it can offset it slightly. Now, it's not going to make things 100% perfect as like finely tuning an animation would, um, but it'll definitely make things a lot easier. Um, as you can see here, they're showing two examples. They have the body intersection goals off. And then once they turn it on, you'll see his hands are going to clip a lot less into his own body. You can see here... If you notice, like when it's off, so see here, this left hand is actually going to go into his belly a little bit here when he does the down dance. See so yeah, how it kind of slips into the body there for a second. When it sets on, it actually avoids slipping into the body. Um, now, it's not going to be necessarily perfect, at least when I've looked at it a few times. There are still, you know, things here or there you may have to tweak if you are an animator, uh, but definitely speeds up your workflow as you don't have to be as precise uh, when you're retargeting from one animation to another. There's not as many changes that need to be made. Uh, another big cool change, um, in my opinion at least, is going to be this one right here. Uh, basically, they added support for one-way physics world collisions, which means basically, as you can see there, um, you can drop characters into a, into a scene and watch them interact with objects. So a lot of it is going to come into um, maps can now be more interactive with characters. Previously, a ball like that dropping on a character um, would have had very little impact, or if it did, it would have been... Um, two-way now with it being one way um, the really cool thing is, is you can see in this example is you can have a character react to something happening and the ball itself does react to the character to an extent uh, but it is focused solely on making the characters more in tune with the environment rather than uh, being something that just moves through the environment which i think is a pretty cool change 
Uh, they add some dependency view things, uh, expanded some virtual production workflow. Most of that's not gonna matter for us devs. Um, a lot of this is more for, you know, cool like live broadcasting things um, for those doing those kind of concerts or, or other real time things. Um, AI assistant, uh, personally, I'm not really interested in that, but if you are, that has been added. Uh, let's see, and that's pretty much it for the main release notes. Uh, if you go ahead and pull up the full release notes, there's actually some pretty cool optimization things in there that they didn't mention in the main uh, talk. Um, let me see if I can find one of the ones I was looking at earlier. Yeah, for example, SMIA. Um, they've basically added a mobile desktop render is now supporting subpixel morphological anti-aliasing. Uh, SMIA, basically you just have to activate it. Um, and from my understanding, this is something that um, pro provides the quality, or at least somewhat near the quality of anti-aliasing that a lot of our other options have um, with, of course, quality settings. Um, but it has a much lower performance impact. I've not played around with it too much myself off the top of my head, um, but it's just a much less expensive um, way to have anti-aliasing. It's currently experimental. Eventually, I assume it'll be included in the dropdown where you can select um, which anti-aliasing option you want. Um, but if you're interested in that, that's now something available as experimental. Um, then of course, you know, all the normal stuff that we're talking about, re reading. I believe, let's see here. Oh, this is the cool stuff for me at least. Um, for world building, they've added some custom HLEDs. Uh, basically, uh, if you know anything about uh, HLODs, uh, basically they've just improved the UX for them inside the engine. It's a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier to use, um, a lot handier for when you're setting those up in the world. Um, of course, all the PCG changes. Uh, improvements and asset workflows they added custom data types um, that I think is quite cool so you can have different custom data types as part of your PCG framework uh, polygon 2d data type and operators um, and then oh this is the one GPU fast geo interop uh, this is great for PCG basically they've added some fast geometry components to further improve upon game thread performances basically when you're running a lot of things for example in the uh, Calypso um, example it's going to hopefully improve the speed of that generation things like that um but yeah and then of course just some normal gpu operators improvements some scene capture stuff um saving textures and support for overrides those are all pretty cool um, those are going to give little improvements here there some more ux improvements uh some new nodes for pcg Oh, a Python interopt plugin. Uh, basically, this provides a new way to execute Python script. Um, this is pretty handy for any of you Python heads. Um, so you can run these scripts. You can provide it as an input or you can run it from a file on the disk. Uh, that's super handy for those of you who um, do a lot of Python work. Uh, this is one I was super excited about. Uh, incremental cooking. Uh, they basically moved it to beta uh, before it was an experimental. And basically, this allows you to iterate faster on target devices with reducing overall cooking time. Um, this is going to save a lot of people a lot of time. Um, especially for those of you who maybe make a small change on a very large project. Um, before uh, this, the engine did try to um, do some amount of incremental cooking, but there was always... Um, issues with, you know, even if you only make a small change, sometimes a lot larger amount of things would be affected by that. So you have to cook more than what you really truly would expect. So from my understanding, at least, is that this is going to improve that. So it's a lot less things being recooked. Uh, they updated the new tools for CPP. Uh, just update to a more recent standard of C++, I believe. Or, sorry, MSV C uh, 1444. Um, this, uh, the build health stuff isn't that important, but something I wanted to mention, uh, some of you may not have seen yet, um, they've added diagnostics within the editor. Um, so you can actually see when you first install 5.7, it'll probably say that, um, your cache is, um, not yet optimized. What that basically is, is the engine slowly figures out, you know, what are the things that are needed to be accessed quickly? What are things that are part of the editor? Um, and, and all kinds of things like that. And it moves them to a cache. Um, and it'll start off somewhere probably like 5%, 10%, and it climbs up as it moves more and more things. 
Um, eventually it'll reach somewhere in the 90% and you want it to kind of be around that. Um, of course, that'll change if you move, you know, a lot of new things in or move between maps that are, that you haven't loaded before, or at least in a really long time. Um, but ideally, um, the more things that are loaded in, the faster your editor is going to run while you're doing things. Um, so it'll help people understand like, oh, hey, why is my editor running slow when normally it runs fast and my package game runs fast? It might just be that your cache hasn't caught up yet. Um, but yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. And I, I hadn't seen it mentioned anywhere in the notes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting stuff. And then I think that's it. There's mobile rendering stuff, some more motion design things, uh, text 3D, rich text, uh, some transition logic, quality of life stuff. I think, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, leave them down below. But otherwise, I think that's it for today. Good luck and good hunting.